Can you? Okay. Yeah. So the recording is started. Um, okay. So welcome, uh, everyone. And this is the third part of the, um, the workshop, continuing on from uh, the previous two parts. Uh, and we've seen in the previous part, uh, the first part was how to install Velociraptor. And then we saw how we can use artifacts and VQL to collect specific, uh, specific things from endpoints. Uh, but it was still kind of uh, very manual, and we had to do uh, to do it a step, you know, individually for each machine. Uh, we've also seen how we can be very targeted. We've seen an example of how we we can detect a typical kind of attack, which is uh, turning off the log files by examining the registry, and uh, we've seen that um, we can we can be very targeted at this, but. We want to be able to do it to lots of clients at the same time so that we can get an answer as to, you know, uh, will, uh, is this network compromised overall? So um, <clears throat> so, so we want to hunt, hunting at scale. So what, what is hunting? When we say hunting uh, in the Velociraptor context, uh, it basically means collecting the same artifact from many different endpoints at the same time. And there's two different approaches or two different like ways to use this uh, this feature. The first one is to be very targeted. If you're very targeted, like in the previous example, you you're asking something very specific. You're like <clears throat> asking, for instance, does this machine have event log turned off? Because that is a strong indicator. And if a machine comes back with yes, it's a yes no question, right? So if if it's yes. Then I'm very concerned about it because that machine should not be configured in this way. So this is a very targeted approach. Uh, at the same time, so it's, uh, at the same time, I can be very uh, uh, untargeted and get more data. And that second approach is used for uh, building more of a baseline. For example, I can ask something like, you know, uh, is this log source configured to uh, to be enabled? And and if it is, uh, you know, like I could get an answer to say most machines have this enabled, but a few don't have it enabled. So now I have a baseline to say most machines have this enabled, and uh, so so this this second approach requires more post processing. We, we're we're going to see that a little bit. All right. So what we're going to do to simulate having many clients because so far we've only been using a single client. Uh, talking with a single client, and um, what we can do is uh, uh, is our task manager. We just put that away. Uh, is we can start Velociraptor uh, with many clients uh, in something called a pool client, and that simulates having lots of different clients. Uh, and so we'll get the feel of how to do a real hunt across the larger network. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, find out. Uh, initially, we're going to go to the temp directory because this is where we created the configuration. When we, uh, if you recall, we're running Velociraptor slash uh, Velociraptor GUI command, and that just creates a local installation. Uh, except it's not the test user; it's the administrator. That's the name of this user. Administrator local temp. Yeah. Oops. And when we ran Velociraptor the GUI, it created essentially uh, all of the installation files in here and it installs in the temp directory. So uh, most important thing is the client config, which tells us uh, how to configure a client. So what we're going to do is we're going to start up uh, a bunch of uh, clients. Uh, with this config file and just start up a hundred of them so we can see how that works. So um, it's going to be, oops, C users, administrators, download. So this is the binary that we had, dash dash config client.config.yaml. We're going to run the pool client commands because this is, you know, we're going to start a pool client uh, and we're going to start up I don't know, let's say 100 clients. And, and what this does is it will create 100 separate instances of clients that just kind of, each of them has their own key, private key, and they're all just going to enroll. 
and connect to the server and basically um, behave as if they're separate clients. So from the server perspective, we should be able to see uh, a bunch of clients. And if we go over here, show all, then we'll see, you know, all of these different clients. So, you know, they, they're all running physically on the same server, right? But they behave as if they are different. So it's a good way of us uh, basically spinning up a bunch of clients for us to uh, uh, simulate a large number of, of clients. So you see that dash 86, dash 55, they're all separate. And so therefore they're, they're considered as completely separate clients. So they all have their own collections, separate collections. Uh, okay, so... Um, so, th so that's how we, we simulate load on the server and we simulate having a lot of clients. So now, um, so this is what it looks like. We're going to create a hunt. Um, and over here in the UI, we have the hunt manager. Hunt manager is where we manage all different hunts. At the moment, there are no hunts. We haven't created any yet. So we're going to create one, click new hunt. Now we can give it a description to say, uh, we're going to look for uh, uh, disabled event logs. This is just for us to remember what we were doing. Now, uh, hunts expire. So what that means is that uh, it will, if a new machine comes up, comes online uh, within this period until the expiry time, then it will still receive the hunt. It will become part of the hunt, right? But and then at a certain point it expires. So the hunt's never really complete because it's not a finite task because we don't know how many machines are out there. We could, you know, in a real network, new machines could be deployed at any time. Um, and so we, we don't necessarily know that we've got all the machines, right? We don't know what the full number is. So we basically don't stop it until the expiry time. And then we can control uh, how to, uh, this is how to target the hunt. We can target it by label. If you recall, I uh, initially added the label uh, for one of the machines before, Mike, and you can see immediately we're estimating that will affect this one machine that has that label, Mike. Uh, but if we just uh, run everywhere, uh, we've got 101 machines because we have 100 uh, machines in the pool client and, 100, and one machine was you know already there before. Uh, we can also, because we are on the root org, we can also specify that, run it in a separate org. Um, Okay, so basically, uh, and these numbers here, they change because uh, in a real deployment, clients come and go. And so you got you typically end up with a lot of dead clients that have been deployed and then decommissioned and they're still in the database. So they're still there. They could come back, but we, you know, we don't know. So to get a better estimate, we can restrict it by like how many machines that are active, that have been active in the last day that would be affected by this hunt. So, so this is just controlling the estimate. Uh, but then we go back and um, if you recall, uh, our artifact is Windows event logs uh, modifications, which checks for the provider channel. Now, if I just um, ran this without any, if you recall uh, from the last session, uh, we could restrict, we could pre-filter those uh, log sources on the endpoint, but if we don't, uh, then it just returns, you know, the status for all of the, you know, all, all of all of the um, log sources. I'll just leave it for now. And and this this would be if I just leave it uh, uh, this way, then it's not targeted. It just returns a lot of data, and this is useful for building a baseline. So so I would do this kind of hunt for a baseline approach to get a baseline, um, and I can do you know specify resources as we've discussed before, um, and I can launch it. So when I first start the hunt, as you can see, uh, it's in the paused state. So it's not running. And because we kind of want to have people think about like, you're just about to deploy this thing on, you know, many machines, thousands of machines in the endpoint, in the organization, um, you know, kind of like <laughs> standby kind of, you know, so you have to, you have to kind of uh, click on it and then press uh, run hunt uh, and then start it. So once it starts, you can see that it immediately starts to schedule the um, the machines, uh, and then and then they they get scheduled and then they complete. So they they finish you know with time, and then pretty soon we've got the results from all of the machines. It it's that quick, right? So we've basically gone through and got all the results in the clients tab. Then we can see you know what each machine returns because this is a pool client. They're all physically running on the same machine, so they're going to return the same thing. 
because they're all the same. <laughs> but uh, you 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 typically get different results in each one, obviously. Um, so so that gives us all the results from all of them. We can look, look in the notebook. Uh, so we can look at individual flows from here, right? Individually. So this is for each client. Uh, but this is just kind of like a preview type uh, UI. But then we have a notebook here where we can actually do some post processing and ana analysis. So let's let's look at how we would do the post processing. So we talked about that. We talked about selecting the event logs. We talked about this. Okay. So so this is a baseline type of um, a baseline type of um, exercise. Um, and then for this exercise, we want to create a few different clients. So. Uh, what we might want to do is we want to, just for this exercise, we want to create something that's a bit different. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop stop this pool client and this pool client ran 100 clients, right? And so when we did the hands, 100 clients uh, did it one way, right? So we, um, oh, the event log is closed, the event log. So the event viewer, and if you recall, the event viewer was... Uh, one way it was probably left it as disabled. Uh, I mean, and and that would have been the baseline. So it'd be like, okay, most machines have this disabled at this point. Um, and uh, oh, come on, uh, Microsoft Windows, uh, Bits Client, where is it? Oh, here, Bits Client, operational. So this log was disabled. And if we enable it now, then we're going to run a few more machines and they will be a little bit different from the rest of them that have already been collected. So we're going to run 110 just for, you know, just a, a few more machines. And then these new machines that are added will uh, participate in the hunt now because they're new, uh, but they will give a slightly different result for this, uh, for this operational thing. So, um, hopefully, then we'll be able to see the difference. So this is showing us how to do stacking. Um, okay, so uh, let's go back to, and you see that immediately, you know, the new machines have, now we've got 111, right? Because another 10 machines started off. Uh, sorry. Okay, so, um, all right. So now uh, this is a notebook. A notebook is a way for us to post-process the results using uh vql queries so by default it just reads all the results uh and as you can tell we, we did a baseline of all the channels right so the first thing that we can do is we can actually add it add vql commands here so let me just uh go where channel name channel name and in vql we've got this equal tilde is like a regular expression match matches bits client, right? So let me just see what happens there. So it's going to go through and it's going to uh, filter out just bits client operational, right? And you can see that's from each host uh, it's coming back. So we've post processed the results from all the, the, um, the clients. And some of them have a zero. And uh, actually some of them uh, will have, you know, perhaps a one. Uh, we've only got 50, we've uh, limited it to 50 because we're not doing the full analysis yet. We're just figuring out the query. So now um, if we grouped it by channel name and enable, that tells us uh, the unique combination of uh, channel names grouped by uh, channel name and enabled. So uh, what does the group by uh, close do? It basically takes the, uh, the data and it puts rows into groups. And the group uh, that has the same value for these, these two parameters, that forms one group. So you can imagine that basically it goes through every row and it says, okay, every time it has operational and zero, right, then uh, that's one group. And if there was an operational and one, uh, that's another group. Right, so um, let me just reformat that. So now, then we can count like this. So we just count the number of items in each group. Okay, so uh, so let's do that. 
So that's going to go through and basically uh, look at unique this unique um, combinations of uh, of group uh, of channel names and um, and whether they're enabled or not. Uh, okay, so that that's going to take a little while. Uh, it's not the most fastest machine, but anyway, it's done it. And so you can see that what's happening now is it's saying, oh, look at this. So uh, when the operational, uh, when this log source is enabled is zero on 101 machines, right? And then it's enabled is one on 10 machines. So this is called stacking. We can see that something is a bit weird. It's something is out of place. Uh, most of the machines have this at zero, but some of them have this at one. So then the question is, what, what makes those a bit different? What, why are they a little bit different? So that, that is called stacking. It's basically being able to, to see the difference between behaviors. Uh, we don't necessarily know which one is correct, but we can immediately say that 10 machines are different from the majority of machines. And usually in a, in a real compromise, you know, you're not going to get every single machine compromised uh, unless it's something like a you know, ransomware or something like that that's infecting everyone, but you, you generally get a few machines that are maybe backdoored, misconfigured, and then the rest of them would be configured properly. So even if you don't know what the correct configuration is, you can find the ones that are standing out. So this is called stacking. Um, all right, so that was the stacking exercise, um, just to understand you know, what stacking is. Um, so we have an NTFS exercise, but I think we're going to skip that uh, because um, it, I just want to get to the offline collector. I'm going to skip this one as well uh, because I want to I want to get to this one because I think that one is you know perhaps more important. Um, the offline collector. Now the offline collector is um, uh, is is some a feature of Velociraptor that is used by many many. <laughs> People and it's uh, probably a, a large percentage of users just use that feature and not anything else that we've seen so far. Um, <clears throat> and it, it basically comes down to so we've seen how we can use artifacts to collect specific things from the endpoint. So we can collect uh, different artifacts, and um, you know, and we can do hunts, etc. And simple artifact collections, uh, we can use client server and just you know add the artifact. It works, right? But a lot of the time, in reality, we cannot really deploy a Velociraptor um, client on the network because for a number of reasons. The first reason, we might not actually own the endpoint. The endpoint might be, especially if we're doing instant response to a different organization, that we don't really control the endpoint software on it. Then we can't just say to them, oh, you've got to install this thing. Sometimes we can, but you know, a lot of the time, there's going to be pushback. They're going to say, we don't really want to install another agent. So we, we may not actually be able to deploy an agent. Um, also, we may not uh, we may not want to do anything permanent. We may not have network access to the agent, right? So it's sometimes not possible. We, can, we may not actually be able to contact it. For instance, a gap network. We might not actually be able to have a server. So there's a number of reasons why we sometimes cannot deploy it in this uh, normal mode that we've seen before. But at the end of the day, Velociraptor is just a VQL engine. So all it does is it runs VQL and collects the results. So all we really want to do is we want to really collect the VQL. We don't really want to uh, worry about um, transporting it or getting the results. That's a separate thing. Uh, what we really want is just collect it and we can analyze it later. And this is what an offline collector is. It's basically uh, a binary that's pre-configured to run or to collect certain things that we already want to collect. And then it just can do that auto autonomously by itself. So how do we build an offline collect collector? So we have the offline collector builder. All we do is we go over to the server artifacts here. And over here, we have build offline collector. So it is just, uh, it's got like a little paper plane because we're gonna basically build this thing and we're gonna send it off and uh, it might land somewhere and return the results. So it's exactly the same as the other UI of building the, uh, the, the collector, 
but it's just a it's just going to be creating a pre-configured collection for us to uh, to build. So uh, for this example, we're going to talk about um, this particular artifact, the Windows Cape Files target. Typically, when you are collecting offline, you want to collect uh, a lot a lot more because you can't really go back and pivot like we did before. Um, so you want to collect more data uh, that it's still not perfect because you're never going to be able to collect everything, right? But you want to get more of more of the data so you can sort of analyze it. And uh, this particular artifact is uh, designed for collecting files. And it's a, a very popular artifact, uh, essentially, Windows Cape File Targets. It comes from uh, another project, which is maintained by Eric Zimmerman, uh, which has a bunch of um, targets files, which tell you uh, different, basically different uh, file globes about finding different uh, files on the system. And, you know, it has lots and lots and lots of different targets, as you can see. Uh, but, you know, each target is essentially, in the end, is just uh, a location of files and a set of files. So when we select these targets, they just basically collect files. It's all about collecting files. Uh, it's not, uh, so it's, it's we're not really analyzing them, we're just collecting the raw files. So typically, we would need to specify um, what kind of collections we want. Um, and, you know, you would recommend, uh, I would recommend a basic collection, which contains, you know, uh, uh, the same hive, for instance, and, and MFD and all this thing, or the sans triage is a little bit more detailed, contains, you know, various MFT artifacts with other things um, and so on. But these are just files, so you need to post-process them afterwards. So for the sake of time, I'm just going to collect something like event logs because, you know, because there's, you know, uh, a lot less of them, but that wouldn't be enough. Normally you would collect more things. And this event logs is already included in the sans triage. So you would just collect that, uh, but just, it just takes less time. So I'm going to, I'm just going to collect that. Um, and okay. And then, so, so we are going, so basically we'll configure this and it says, I'm going to collect these, these artifacts. So there could be any artifacts. It doesn't necessarily just have to be the Cape triage. It could be anything. Um, but all it's going to do is it's going to basically take them and put them in a zip file. So now we're going to configure the collector itself, figuring out where does this data go? Okay, so um, here, let me just point out a couple of things. So we can choose the encryption. Uh, when we collect the data, it creates a zip file with the data in it. Now the data contains, you know, potentially very sensitive information. Uh, and so we may not, uh, we may want to protect this information somehow um, because we're going to rely on this data to be transported, you know, via some means, which we don't know what. So there might be there might be a potential for compromise. So usually I would recommend this data be encrypted. Um, and there are a number of different types of encryption that we support. Um, none, obviously, is the, the default. But the most recommended one is to use this X509 certificate. And what this does is it uses the server itself. So this server that I'm using now, uh, its own certificate to essentially encrypt uh, using PKI to create an encryption key for the container. And then using that, um, the only thing that can decrypt it is having this certificate and the private key from this particular installation. So every installation would be different. And the only way to decrypt it is, um, is using this very server file. So uh, I would recommend that would be the most, you know, normal, the most logical uh, thing to do because it's very easy. You just click the thing, off we go. And then we can create a zip file. We can also automatically upload it to uh, another thing. Uh, targets, so Google Cloud Bucket, AWS, Azure, these kind of things. Uh, by default, it's just a zip file. Um, and really, that's that's really all it is. We can specify resources as well, not as many as uh, we can with the other one. Uh, we can specify execution time, the CPU limit, and so on. But usually, these things are done interactively, so we don't really usually, uh, we, we usually just go as fast as possible because literally the user is going to be like running it, you know, from, from the um, interactively. So, okay. So what it's going to do now is 
it's going to download the proper binary, the Windows binary of Velociraptor. And then uh, it's going to go through and uh, package, uh, create a configuration file that tells Velociraptor uh, to do what we just you know, told it to do and embed it, the configuration file inside the binary uh, and then make it available here. So this is now the, uh, the, the file that we've created, right? So it's an executable. So if we just download it, uh, so it's going to, uh, it's going to go, uh, keep, yep. Keep anyway. Okay. And, um, so, uh, <clears throat> this executable, let me just start up a command shell. Yeah. Okay. And it's going to be, we downloaded it in here. All right. So it is just, it is just a Velociraptor binary, but it, Inside of it, it has an embedded configuration, which we can see it, config show. And this is where, um, you know, what we told it to do, you know, happens with the right keys and all this thing, because we said we want to encrypt it. So it's already pre-configured. So the idea is that you give this to someone that might actually be like a help desk person, or it might, it might not, they might not actually be a DFIR person at all. And so, you know, if we give them a, the full Velociraptor tool with like, okay, you got to type these command line and it's it's not going to happen, right? Like they're just going to get, you know, confused. So it's better to have the offline collector like just fully working, right? And all they have to do is run it. So uh, as administrator, but they're still running it. And you see, all I had to do is just run the binary and it knows what it has to do. It goes off and it collects the things, in this case, the event logs, because we, you know, that's what we asked it to do. Uh, and then uh, you can see up here, it tells us, you know, what's what's going on, what it's doing. Uh, so let's just scroll a bit faster to the start. Yep. So the first thing it will do is it says, you know, I'm going to collect this package. Uh, I'm going to uh, generate a container password using X509. And I'm going to pr protect the, the, the zip file and create the container. And then it goes off finding the event logs and and all that sort of thing and then it, it calculates the container hash and calculates the thing and it's it's done right so if i look uh at the downloads folder now here so this is the collection the zip file that i've created uh and again because it's encrypted then there is really only one file in it uh, because zip file encryption doesn't support encrypting file names so we can't just have raw file names in it because it's information leakage so we can see the compressed folder in it that contains all the data. And the only way that we can open it is using this uh, server because it's encrypted. So, uh, so we can import that data. So cre we created the collector and we imagine that collection was done somewhere, you know, um, somewhere else, right? Like uh, uh, offline at another server. So now we want to actually import that data, right? We want to get that data back. Uh, let me just see whether I've mentioned everything I'm supposed to mention. Just a moment. So yeah, so we went through, we selected the Cape artifact, we selected the X509 certificate, got the prepared binary, ran the prepared binary with the armored zip, zip file, and we saw the output and uh, the file is encrypted. And we already discussed that due to the limitation of the zip format, we can't actually just rely on zip file to protect the names of the files. So we basically create an, another file inside of that, so call it. Um, and there's a metadata here that allows us to decrypt it given the right private key. Okay, so now we wanna be able to get this data, which you know we can't, it's encrypted, right? So, um, so what we need to do is use Velociraptor to unpack that file to decrypt it properly. Uh, and then the way we do that is by importing it into Velociraptor. Now, when you think about it, it's really just, we're just really kind of using Velociraptor, but but it's instead of using the internet for communicating with the client, we're using SneakerNet for someone to bring us the file, right? And then we are loading it into Velociraptor. So so we can just do that. Uh, we, could, we could just get the file and import it back into Velociraptor. So let's do that. So we're going to type import. So it's going to be a server artifact because we're going to run it on the server, right? We're going to import a collection 
Yeah. So this is the file. And then we're going to need to basically tell it um, kind of the auto host. So we can append it to a particular client if we know, but this one, assume it's just a, an unknown client. It's just came from somewhere. And the path is going to be the path to, yeah, to the file, the zip file. So we just uh, have to put that on the server so we can you know, import it. So we just write that here. Yeah, so it's just the zip file that you know, we created. Um, and, and that's basically it. So we, we go off and import that. Now, what that will do, and I'll just show you the query log so it, it shows us what it's done, is it's creating a new client because this is coming from an unknown client, uh, offline collector, all right? So it comes from somewhere else. It's not a real client. It doesn't know, but it has to you know, fit inside the GUI. So it creates a new client so uh, for it. Uh, and then it imports the collection into the client, right? So uh, if we just copy that and paste it here, okay? Uh, then I will see that this is a new client, right? If I look at it, it actually looks a bit different because it looks a bit weird from all the other clients. It actually uh, doesn't really have an agent version because we don't know who created this collection. And, you know, we've just, it's just been created now and doesn't really have a lot of metadata about it because this is an offline client, right? It's just created just to put the data in there. So if we click on a collected, uh, then because we imported that collection into it, it looks as though we just collected this like a normal client. And this is really important because if you're writing some automation around uh, being able to post-process collections and so on, you don't really want to have any practical difference between an import from an offline collector and you know actually collecting real, you know um, we, with the client, right? A normal collection. Um, so they are they look exactly the same to the system. They're basically the same. The only difference really is that the takeaway from this is the offline collector is just a sneaker net like it's just a way of delivering the data uh, by other means but other than that it's exactly the same as talking to another client right so the same kind of results you know we've collected all the event log files we've already seen that so they're all in here you know we can preview them all the same it's exactly the same uh thing see and uh we can um you know go to the end go to the start preview it you know, whatever. So, yeah, so all of these things are uh, the same. So this basically, uh, but the container is encrypted uh, and the only thing that can import it is this server so we can import it back again, right? So that preserves the PII, confidential information in transit. Uh, and then I've shown you how to do this, importing it, uh, client ID is auto. If you, if you want to uh, um, append this collection to an existing client that's already out there, then you can change the client ID to that client and import into that. Uh, but, you know, it basically looks exactly the same. Okay. Um, so, so that was uh, the offline collector. It's kind of a huge, uh, a very important um, feature. A lot of people use, use it. Uh, and it's just a way of not having to install Velociraptor. It's just yet another agent. Uh, but you still end up with all the, the same um, the same capabilities. Uh, I'm just going to go quickly uh, switch switch order to the next topic, uh, memory artifacts. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to show you how Velociraptor can find things in memory. Uh, and uh, that's a very interesting topic. So we've seen before how we can just grab files. We've seen how we can parse files. Um, and files, and files are fine. And a lot of digital forensics is really concentrating around files. Like we talked about disk uh, images and, you know, being able to get files back. Uh, and that's important, but it's not really the, the you know, everything about the endpoint. Uh, and one of the interesting things about the endpoint is looking at memory and being able to uh, analyze or extract uh, information from memory. Uh, because a lot of threads are only present in memory. And um, this is an, uh, what we're going to do uh, in this example is talk about how to detect uh, Cobalt Strike Beacon. Cobalt Strike is a very popular attack tool that many ransomware gangs use. And, um, and so 
it's it's a pretty good tool and it has memory only beacon so we can so it basically doesn't really touch the disk it doesn't really have files on disk and uh, the only way, uh, well, one of the common ways to detect it is in memory. And the way it works is it injects itself into memory. So I, I don't have Cobalt Strike here, and we, we don't really want to actually run it, a proper Cobalt Strike beacon. But what I actually have instead is a small program, and we use that to detect, to test this kind of features, which injects the Cobalt Strike beacon into memory. So it doesn't really run, but it's just, it's still, it's still the, the same binary is or samples from it is injected into another process and it sort of simulates a beacon running from another process like so we don't actually run the, the code but it's the same code that's just basically being injected into another process so um i have a small test program here called injector and what it does is it just injects this sample into another process um and uh and then we can use that to test um to, to test uh memory detections so uh let's just jump into there uh download the loader uh binary um you know download that and uh and then we will use that to inject cobalt strike into a sample so what we want to do is uh let's say we'll let's pick up um so this is chrome I mean, let's just do Notepad just for the sake of speed. It's a bit easier. It does, doesn't really matter which process. So I'm just going to open Notepad. So this is just a regular Notepad. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the, the process ID of this Notepad. So Notepad. Okay. And it's going to be 10.0236. Uh, okay. So now what I'm going to do is I have the loader. And if I, I can go dash H and it tells me like how to, you know, run it. And all I have to do is give it the, um, the name or the pr process ID, 10, 0, 2, 3, 6. Okay. And of course your number will be different when you, when you do that. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to wait a little bit because uh, Windows Defender apparently does like, you know, scanning of new processes as they started. So it might actually find the um so so the the sample triggers you know known signatures so it might actually find it so all you have to do is wait a bit and uh, let windows defender relax a bit and then you can and then you can inject the process right so once it uh, waits a little bit it doesn't it's finished scanning the process it looks okay then it decrypts it and it injects it so it so it doesn't really um anyway bypasses windows defender a little bit so you can see that what it's done is it's found, uh, it's just a standard process injection. It opens the process, allocates memory, and writes the sample in it. But we don't running anything. So inside of this process now, there's going to be a Cobalt Struck beacon running. Uh, not, not running, but it's in there, right? Um, OK, so now what we want to do is detect that Cobalt Struck beacon. So we're going to use this uh, Windows detection Yara process to search process memory for Yara signatures. And uh, that allows us to, so let's find that artifact, process memory. Okay, so we've got uh, Windows detection, uh, detection Yara process. So this one uh, is going to basically look for uh, as signatures in memory of you know, whatever we want, but usually a Yara rule uh, is used to specify the signature. So if we just, you can change the rule to anything you want uh, and you can have other rules, but by default, the one that comes built in, we, we just have Cobalt Strike in there um, because I guess it's easy to pr prove, but you can, it's easy for demonstration, but you can change that rule to anything. So you can see this particular rule was created by Malpedia, which is a project to come up with resilient signatures for a lot of the malware, uh, resilient so that even as they change versions and new versions, new variants come out, uh, those rules are still going to be robust enough to, to trigger. And so you can see that the way they do it is by having a bunch of signatures with a lot of you know potential wildcards. And it's, a, it's an interesting project. There's the machine learning and all that to kind of calculate this. But anyway, 
what we do is we just kind of use that signature and we're going to deploy it. Now you can just do it for all the processes. It's going to take a little while, uh, or we can just target it um, to Notepad uh, for for efficiency. Uh, and then uh, once once we're finished, uh, if if we find a hit, we can upload it. So that uploads the process memory, so we can uh, analyze it, you know, further, um, and um, so on. We can we can look for. Um, yeah, we can whitelist it and uh, various things. Uh, okay, so uh, so basically, when we do this, so let's go and uh, launch that. So what this will do is it will look at all the processes on this machine and all the Notepad processes, and then apply the arrow signature and see if we can detect the beacon, the cobalt struck beacon, uh, which you know hopefully we should. Um, so. Uh, off we go. What is it doing? Oh, sorry. This is the offline. <laughs> this is the offline client. It's not a real client. So it's actually, we can't actually uh, make it work because it's not a real client. Let's, let's try that again. <laughs> so let's look for the mic machine that I've labeled before. Collected. Uh, memory. Do that again. Yep. Okay, so the same thing. We're going to upload the hits and we're going to target Notepad. Okay. And we're just going to use this. So now we can launch it. And the client is connected, so it should pick it up uh, immediately. And immediately you can start to see that it's it's uh, created a hit and it's going to send us some data. Uh, uploaded. Uh, it's starting to upload the memory image. And then we've got a hit. So let's look at the hit. And we can see that we have a Yara hit. So we we hit the, we've got a uh, con we've got some context that we can see. So this is one of the signatures that we triggered. Uh, and then uh, we've got the metadata of the Yara rule that triggered. So we can see what the hit was. And over here we've got the process dump. So we've actually uploaded the memory dump, and we can open that in a debugger and reverse engineer it, all this sort of stuff. Um, so that is pretty uh, pretty easy uh, for us to detect. So from a DFIR perspective now, what we, we've got the memory dump, which we can just get from the uploaded files that there it is. And um, what we can do is we can say, well, okay, can we um, use that? Uh, now we're going to have to analyze it and figure out like, okay, is that really a cobalt strike or is it just false positive? Uh, but most importantly, we want to get the information uh, be, that's embedded in the beacon's memory, particularly which one, uh, which is the CNC, where are we going to connect to? Uh, you know, who, what are the indicators specifically about, because the, the thing about cobalt strike is it's very hard to, um, to hunt for it because uh, Cobalt Strike has something called a malleable CNC where the indicators that we would typically think of like IP addresses, URLs, uh, headers, uh, all these kind of things that we normally can find in network uh, uh, network ISCs and things like that, you can change all that. So most of the groups that use Cobalt Strike, they will customize uh, the, the, the CNC or the way that it communicates so that it's, you know, they'll have completely new random, essentially indicators. So then we won't be able to detect that very easily. Now, if we happen to find a sample in memory, what we really need to get out of it is uh, very quickly is to find these CNC. So now we can, so then we can leverage our detections across other systems so that we can hunt for that particular operation that targets our, um, that is the target. So what we really want to do, so while this one is really good, it, it, it's a great detection, it tells us there is something weird here, here's the memory image, and we can use that. We want, we want more. We want more than that. We want to be able to say, tell us what the configuration that you found in memory of this CNC, right? So this is where we need something that's very uh, Cobalt Strike specific because we want, to, we want to be able to actually carve out the Cobalt Strike configuration and decode it from memory and decode it, right? So uh, this is, so this artifact is extremely sophisticated. You can see that it 
it's all in VQL, but it can decrypt the the configuration itself is encrypted in memory. It can decrypt it and extract it and pass it all out. It's quite a long, complicated artifact. But at the end of the day, it just tells us what it thinks are the CNC uh, indicators uh, that are in this particular sample. So let's um, so let's use this artifact now that we have a positive heat, um, and we know it was a notepad. So we can now further restrict that to a specific um, uh, a specific um, process and even a PID. And, uh, and then we can, we can, uh, yeah, so we can basically try and decode that, um, that memory sample, like on the endpoint and just bring back specifically the decoded configuration. So, uh, so that you can see that we ran it, it immediately came up with two results and it used that to decode the configuration. This is the decoded configuration uh, of the Cobalt Strike. And Cobalt Strike allows you to change uh, the way that it communicates, the CNC. And so particularly, this is really important because this is showing us what the URL that it uses to connect back to the C CNC server and, uh, and what the URL is and what the IP address. So now we can use this to leverage our network detections to try and find uh, more beaconing activity going on from a similar beacon that was configured in this. Usually what they do is they create a campaign and then they will use that same tool in that campaign. So once we've got it from the memory, we extract the C2 and then we can use that across our network detections to detect the, you know, of course they can create a new, a new beacon, but at least we can use that uh, to at least inter interfere with this particular campaign. Um, so there's a number of different uh, settings that they can change. Uh, <clears throat> this is the, the binary that it uses to, to spawn. So this is useful for uh, detection with EDR, understanding um, you know, the post URL and other things. So, so, so this is really, really valuable being able to decode this um, in real time and use that to, um, you know, to, to, to um, pivot across the deployment. Okay, so uh, let's go back. So we're just covering off on this. So the error process, we are able to extract the process and then we can decode it. Right? We can uh, deploy error rules to identify the configuration, decrypt it and all that sort of stuff. And we can use VQL to parse out complex memory structures so that we can um, you know, uh, be able to extract this C2 from memory. Uh, and that's that's actually pretty interesting. Um, now, what would be the next? So we've kind of gone back. We filled out that, so that's all right. Um, we can do some of the NTFS uh, exercises, but they're kind of more elaborate. Um, we did the hunting. We did the stacking. I mean, we can we can do the NTFS, I guess. Yeah. Maybe we have like five minutes. I mean, for the last five minutes, we talked about uh, do the process tracker. That's going to take more than five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I think we're kind of running low on time. Um, what do you guys think? Do we want to keep going or you want to... Um, Cut it out and finish it now. No, just uh, 